Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Otem, and today we'll talk about a unique publication of madrigals from 1601 by Luzzasco Luzzaschi. The composer Luzzasco Luzzaschi is mostly known today thanks to his publication of madrigals from 1601 which is believed to represent some of the musical activity of the famous Concerto delle Dame, a small yet well-documented ensemble of virtuoso female singers, which was active during the last decades of the 16th century in Ferrara. Apart from this connection and the fabulous music that is in it, the publication is interesting for many other reasons. Printing technique, the art of arrangement, ornamentation, accompaniment, and more. In this episode, we will look into this very interesting source. Let's start. The full title of the publication reads as follows. Madrigals by Luzzasco Luzzaschi for singing and playing, per cantare e sonare, for one, two, and three sopranos, made for the music of the late serene Duke Alfonso of Este, printed in Rome by Simone Verovio, 1601. This publication is believed to represent part of the repertoire the so-called Concerto delle Dame were performing some decades earlier at the Este Court in Ferrara. This ensemble supplied private and exclusive music at the court and was repeatedly praised for the vocal diminutions made by its female singers. The testimonies describe how the singers were also playing various instruments while singing, or at other times sometimes as soloists and sometimes in duets or terzets, were accompanied by Luzzaschi himself on the harpsichord. Looking at the pieces in the collection, we see a score, vocal parts with written out diminutions, and a keyboard intabulation for accompaniment. These are two rather unusual features. 1. Written out diminutions from the middle of the 16th century onwards, we find more and more sources that say and demonstrate how good singers add diminutions to the original simple parts of pieces. The composer supplied the basic line, and the singers, according to their taste and abilities, added diminutions. Why then, in the case of Lutsaski, were the diminutions written out note for note? We'll try to answer that later. 2. Keyboard intabulations for the accompaniment. As you well know, at the period of these compositions, the late 16th century, the vast majority of music was for several voices and published in separate part books. This, by the way, includes all the other music publications of Luzzaschi. If one wanted to play the music on a keyboard or lute instrument, for example, either as a purely instrumental version or for accompaniment purposes, they had to take each of the separate parts and intabulate them in a way that would suit their instrument. We discussed that in our episode about intabulation. Check it out if you need to refresh your memory. Why then did Luzzaschi supply us with a ready-made intabulation? Also, normally in that period, the polyphonic fabric of music is made of four to six individual parts, but in this publication there are only one, two or three parts. Where are the others? Could it be that in the case of this publication, and unlike the common practice, we are not being presented with the raw materials, but rather that the music was already arranged, ornamented, and prepared for a performer to merely execute it. Another possibility is that the sprint was not meant for performance at all, but instead was only meant for intellectual contemplation, or as an expensive souvenir, supposedly commemorating what took place in the private performances of the Concerto delle Dame. Either or both of these assumptions may be true, but in order to know more, let's take a look at other publications of the same publisher. Between 1586 and 1607, Simone Verovio is known to have participated in the publication of at least 13 music prints. There are several special features in these prints, most notably their printing technique. They are made using engraving instead of the standard movable type. Let's see. The vast majority of prints in the 16th century, whether textbooks or music books, were made using movable type. This is done using little blocks, on each of which there is a letter or a note, including the lines of the stave, 
or whatever they could fit on one little block. Then, these blocks would have been arranged in the right order and each page prepared. Regarding music, such a technique was very good for printing parts, and thus became the most common way of printing music. The difficulty starts when more than one note is expected to appear at the same time on one stave. This demands either many little blocks, or blocks of many kinds. For lute tablature, this is complicated but still manageable. But in keyboard intabulations, due to the multitude of voices and note values that should be able to appear simultaneously, it can get very complicated, and often the final result is just unclear. Therefore, printing keyboard intabulations using that technique was difficult, time consuming, and not so friendly to the reader. What is more feasible to do using movable type is to print keyboard scores, as each line is as simple as a standard part, only that special care and many blank blocks are needed in order to visually synchronize the bars. Such scores for keyboard music were popular in Naples, and even Frescobaldi printed his contrapuntal works in that manner claiming that this lost practice of playing from scores is of paramount importance for such music and differentiates the true virtuoso from the ignorant. However, such scores take a lot of space and seem like an overkill for simpler music. Here Simone Verovio comes into the picture, who used another printing technique, engraving, where it is possible, just like in a manuscript, to engrave practically whatever one wants onto a copper plate, and then make prints from it. The flexibility it gives to the printer is tremendous in comparison with movable type. Keyboard intabulations with many details look beautiful and are very easy to read. Also, the custom beaming, which is near to impossible using movable type, make the reading of diminutions easier and even can suggest phrasing or help with text underlay. Of course, engraving has also its downsides. It takes more time to prepare and costs more money. Nevertheless, Verovio went for it, and thanks to the flexibility gained by this technique, he was able to make prints attractive for a wide audience. Let's have a look at this piece from his 1591 collection of canzonette. Instead of the standard part book format, where separate books were printed for each part, Verovio placed all the parts on a single opening, like a choir book. There are the four different voices, and intabulations of these four voices, both for keyboard and for lute. Not only are the intabulations ready-made, either for the accompaniment of voices or to play alone, they are also pre-transposed according to the practices regarding high clefts. Check our episode about that if you want to know more. All this made the life of the performers much easier. Perhaps in order to demonstrate the variety of possibilities that his print suggests, on the title page of this particular publication, he included an engraving of a female and a male lute player, a boy playing a flute, a woman playing a spinet, and two female singers. Indeed, the Verovio layout offers many different performance possibilities from one lute playing alone, through a cappella ensemble singing, to big ensembles combining singers and different instruments, both melodic and harmonic. Since Verovio's prints were so well made, they attracted the attention of great composers, for example Claudio Merulo, who commissioned him to print his toccatas. Let's now get back to Luzzaschi's madrigals from 1601 and try to understand them better. Unlike the Verovio print we saw earlier, where all the parts of the composition are laid out in front of us in addition to intabulations of these voices, here we have something different, a score. The piece is the combination of the parts and the accompaniment. Unlike the earlier examples, they cannot work separately. In accordance with the concept of intabulations, the voices are included in it but in an unornamented version. However, something is missing. Where do the bass and other inner voices come from? In other words, what is this keyboard part actually intabulating? A similar situation is found in pieces from the Carlo G manuscript. There are one or two ornamented voices with a keyboard intabulation for accompaniment. 
Above this particular piece are found the words Se bramate chi omora di Luca Marenzio. Indeed, Luca Marenzio has a piece published in 1587 for six voices called Se bramate chi omora. It seems that someone, perhaps Carlo G, took this piece, intabulated all the voices into a single keyboard part, and then took the two upper parts, adding ornaments to them, and changing the Italian text to a Latin sacred text. A common procedure at the time referred to as contrafactum. Lastly, since the original piece was written in high clefs, in this ready-to-use version, both the keyboard and the vocal parts are transposed. Could it be that the pieces of Lutsaski went through a similar process? That they were originally for five or so voices and then arranged for this purpose? It very well might be the case, but unfortunately none of the pieces from that collection were found in other sources in another form, so we cannot verify this hypothesis. As you see, it is not completely clear what Lutsaski's pieces are. Are they unconventional original pieces? or are they merely arrangements of polyphonic madrigals? While we cannot really answer these questions, apart from enjoying the music, we can examine some subjects in more detail. Let's start with the diminutions. In several of the testimonies from the 1580s concerning the Concerto delle Dame, we are told that the singers were singing by heart, and some lucky listeners were presented with a music book that included the sung diminutions. That is, instead of the singers improvising the diminutions as was the standard, they were composed note for note, and thus were part of the piece and part of the spectacle. Whether the 1601 publication is similar in a way to the book referred to in these testimonies, we don't know, but it might explain why Lutsaski included his written out diminutions in his publication. At any rate, we gain from this. We are given a demonstration by a great composer of how, where, and how much he would ornament his pieces. Similar to Maffei's preference we mentioned in another episode, most of the diminutions are found toward the end of musical phrases, at cadences. Otherwise, they appear only occasionally and are short. When the music repeats, sometimes the first time around is without diminutions, and the second time with. In other cases, the repetition simply introduces another diminution. Looking at an excerpt from the piece Aura Soave, we notice how Lutsaski not only carefully takes the notes of the diminutions into consideration, but also the note values. He gradually accelerates and gradually decelerates. Rarely does he jump from a long value to a short value directly. In addition, he uses sequences, but not too frequently all in good taste. Let's listen to this phrase, first without the diminution. Sadly, I cannot sing it, so it is only instrumental. And now, with the diminutions. We of course tend to focus on the exciting diminutions, but we should also note the very long stretches with no diminutions whatsoever. This once again goes with what Maffei wrote, you must not add too many diminutions, because when you enjoy the sweetness rarely, you desire it more. Apart from the beauty of the diminutions of the individual lines, moments of great splendor occur in the pieces for two and three voices, where at cadences, all the voices are making diminutions at the same time. This goes against the recommendation of most sources, but in this case it is done by a clever composer who knows exactly what he is doing. Do go on and look for some recordings of this music, or even better, try it yourself. Very often, the keyboard accompaniments of Lutsaski's madrigals are mentioned in connection with early basso continuo. Let's see why. Before further discussing this, we should remember that the concept and the term of basso continuo 
was still in development in the 1580s. This included, however, the notion that it is not always necessary to have all the voices meticulously written out for accompanists, as was the norm. It is possible, when the music is not too complicated, to have the bass alone, and an experienced player would be able to complete the missing information adequately. This is supported by a letter which is connected directly with the Concerto delle Dame. In 1584, the composer Alessandro Strigio was asked by the court in Ferrara to compose music for the concerto. More specifically, music for soprano voices with diminutions. In one letter, he reports that he had accepted the commission and composed a piece for two sopranos, but that unfortunately he forgot the lute intabulation of it at home. He adds, however, that this will matter little, for Signor Giulio, Giulio Caccini, who worked in Ferrara at that time, will be easily able to play the bass part, either on the lute or on the harpsichord. From this we learn that by saying that he composed a piece for two sopranos, he actually meant a piece for two sopranos and a bass part, and that an accomplished musician would easily be able to take this part and play an accompaniment above it. This indeed sounds like what basso continuo is, and seems to go with how Lutsaski presents his pieces. When he writes a doi soprani for two sopranos, he means in fact two sopranos and a bass with some additional inner voices. Having this idea in the background, one might imagine that Lutsaski's pieces were composed first with only the solo voices and the bass, basso continuo if you want, and then the keyboard part was filled in. However, while the common definition of basso continuo allows the accompanist to play whatever he wants as long as it does not contradict the counterpoint of the piece, Lutsaski's realizations are something quite different. They are very much a continuation of the Renaissance accompaniment tradition, where the accompaniment is simply a performance of the parts of the composition. Therefore, Lutsaski's accompaniment is first and foremost made out of the voices of the composition. When a voice is sung, it is always doubled in the accompaniment, only without ornaments. So in a piece for two high voices, the accompaniment will include these two voices and the bass. The only thing missing would be some inner parts here and there. When, however, the voices have rests, the accompaniment fills in, and then one can see a better connection between this and basso continuo. It seems that the visual aesthetics of the intabulations was important for Lutsaski in the case of this sprint. When putting together voices in an intabulation, due to voice crossing and the limitations of the notation, it might seem that forbidden parallels had been written. We see this in many intabulations, and it is even referred to in basso continuo treatises. For Lutsaski, however, this was not good enough. He wanted his music not only to be correct, but also to look correct. Thus, he made an exceptional and unique effort so that no parallels are seen, either intellectually or visually. His visual strictness might also explain why he chose to remain constantly in four voices in the accompaniment, although there is no particular reason seen to necessitate such a choice in other sources either in tabulations or later on in basso continuo treatises. A last note should be said about the pieces in high clefs in the collection. In the other sources presented in this episode, high clef pieces, unsurprisingly, were always transposed. In the Verovio print from 1591, the voices were in their original form, but the keyboard part was transposed, making the final result transposed. In the Carlo G manuscript, since it was a score, both the voices and the keyboard part were transposed. In Lutsaski's print from 1601, however, the pieces in high clefs seem to be in their original high state. It might be that this has to do, again, with aesthetics. Transposition merely shifts the same music to a different pitch, but sometimes such simple changes are rather ugly on the paper requiring the addition of accidental signs. At any rate, performing the pieces with high clefs as they are is simply too high. It's a too high. 
and there is enough other evidence to support transposition whether it is evident in the source or not. So, thanks to Lutsaski's wonderful source from 1601, we talked about printing techniques, arrangements, diminutions, accompaniments, and more. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you enjoy early music sources, feel free to support us on Patreon, comment, share, and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.